New York City, NYC, the epicenter from which the green poison spread. Hostile factions ruled the different districts of Manhattan and Brooklyn, perhaps even the rest of NYC too. The first wave of agents weren't able to push them back, but the second wave made a lot of progress. New wave of agents just strolled in. Hell of a way to make an entrance. Chopper got shot down in Brooklyn, then they got mixed up in that Lincoln Tunnel mess. One of them did, anyway. Fei Lao's gonna need some recovery time at the base of operations before she's field ready. The other one looks fine. And see how long it is before the city chews them up and spits them out. But what happened in New York in the six to seven months that have passed? As Aaron Keener stated in his dead drops, he returned to NYC. When he did, he was surprised to see the quarantine was gone, but tunnels and waters that were guarded by the Joint Task Force or JTF and Coast Guard were left unattended. For the first time in months, this left NYC's borders open for people to leave and people to come in. In a way, it's a shame the quarantine isn't still up on Manhattan. It would have been a challenge for a minute or two trying to sneak back in. But it was all gone. The boats, the barricades, everything. Hard to blame the boys for giving up when everyone else had given up on them. Keener's visit was bad news. His return to NYC can't mean anything good, although it's unknown what he was doing there. Not everyone wearing the orange is as good a person as Lau. She got hurt, she stuck it out, and she found a way to help. Some others, well, they got their feelings hurt and decided to go rogue. You heard me. They took all the gear and training they'd been given and they went their own way. Sometimes they even took out other agents. The worst of the lot's a guy named Aaron Keener. He'd as soon kill you as look at you. And he's playing a long game. He's got Amherst tools for cooking up a new virus. And he's got a hostage named Chernenko who can show him how to do it. Oh, and nobody knows where he is. So if Green Poison 2.0 pops up around these parts, you'll know who to thank for it. Within the city, the green poison that raged only six to seven months ago started to die down. So we all know how we got in this mess, right? A psycho named Dr. Gordon Amherst cooked up his homebrew smallpox variant and spread it around on cash on Black Friday. And well, things got a little out of hand after that. The good news, if there can be any kind of good news in something like this, is that the virus looks like it's mostly burnt itself out. You can still find pockets if you go looking for it, but why in the hell would you want to do that? In Manhattan, each wing of the base of operations was led by one of our crew members. Let me take this opportunity to introduce them to you for those who don't know them and for those that might need an update. The security wing is under the command of Captain Roy Benitez, the person who will help me in this intel brief. Being raised by a police officer father on the bayside in Queens, Benitez aspired to join the force at an early age. He signed up at the earliest opportunity and worked his way into the narcotics department. He spent then 8 years being a narcotics officer before he was a first responder at 9-11. Benitez has been described by his superiors as stubborn and relentless. He and his wife were on the verge of a separation when the Greek poison tragically claimed her life. Already strained by both his commitment to the force and their inability to have children, Benitez's newfound loss carries a guilt he struggles to reconcile. However, his loss, like so many of his experiences, has only challenged him to go beyond his emotional comfort level. He believes there's only ever a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. He is an idealist who isn't afraid to make enemies. While he strives to go above and beyond the call of duty, he often finds himself at a crossroads, struggling to find the confidence to do so. The medical wing is led by Jessica Kendall. She was raised by her father on the Upper West Side in Chelsea Tower after her mother died of pancreatic cancer. She is an intellectual who is always pursuing new challenges and tries to advance her career. After graduating top of her class at both MIT and John Hopkins University, she completed a postdoctoral DCD fellowship. She was then recruited by tech startup Gen Evo Labs as a biomedical engineer. She married a woman by the name of Alexis Kwan, but the marriage didn't last and they divorced before the pandemic happened. Kendall is known for her intellectual curiosity. She enjoys the thrill of solving a puzzle and never backs down from a difficult challenge. Other people often find her drive and self-confidence intimidating and her ex-wife described her as better with pathogens than with people. 
but she was invaluable in the creation of the vaccine for the green poison and in turn for the broad spectrum antiviral. The tech wing was run by Paul Rhodes, a former member of the Last Man Battalion or LMB. Rhodes was born and raised in Central Jersey. He has a degree in electrical engineering and a master's in computer science. After he lost his wife in 9-11, Rhodes became a drifter, bouncing between various tech shops throughout America. His disdain of the US government and his wayfaring eventually brought him to Iraq in 2003, where he served as a contractor for the LMB. He returned from the war, after a roadside ambush claimed the lives of many of his squadmates. Since his return, Rhodes suffered from a severe case of survivor's guilt. He's twitchy and cynical and, while he never admits it, he always goes the extra mile to get the job done right. Scarred by the death of his wife, he stays away from intimate relationships, benign or adverse. Altogether, the wings of the base of operations were led by Fei Lau. When she was a teenager, her parents died in a car accident, leaving her to raise her younger sister, Heather Lau, on her own. After completing a degree in economics and a master's in strategic studies, Lau joined the Reserves Officer Training Corps, or ROTC. She subsequently started working for national security. After she got activated as part of the second wave, a field accident left her left leg and right eye severely injured and now she serves as a handler, responsible for the base maintenance and collecting and giving intel to their agents. Owed in part to the loss of her parents, Lau has kept a distance from intimacy for much of her life, having regarded it as a potential disruption to her education and career. Lau is a strong and serious woman, competitive, driven and full of grit. There's no questioning her status as a devoted patriot. She has a keen sense of observation and is known for her loyalty and pragmatism. But how is her crew doing, Mr. Benitez? Well, I'm not going to say that things are good, because they ain't, but they're a bit better than they were. Doc Kandel is holding down the medical end of things, which is good, and Rhodes is up to whatever crazy shit he does with the systems, and meanwhile, Lau and her friend are doing their best to clean up this mess. It's a big effort. It's going to take all of us, and a whole lot more besides. But for the first time in a long time, I think we got a shot. Although the situation wasn't as bad as it was first, it wasn't good yet, as Benitez mentioned. Since Jessica Kendall sent a broad-spectrum antiviral to Ann Arbor, she focused on assisting Dr. Ellis in the medical wing. Whatever Paul Rhodes is doing is unknown, he usually just does what he wants, and Fei Lau is recovered and kicking ass alongside our agent from Manhattan. However, Manhattan is far from how it used to be. Hostile factions still roam the streets, Rikers, cleaners and the LMB are still being a pain in the butt. I'll give you a quick rundown on the factions. There's nothing known about the rioters, probably because they're not an organized threat. The Rikers, however, still pose a threat. Rikers are hardened criminals who took advantage of the green poison outbreak to escape from Rikers Island. They have an innate hatred for the authorities, particularly the New York Police Department or NYPD and JTF. Since the death of their leader, Larry Barrett, the Rikers have scattered and are no longer considered a threat. When it comes to the Rikers, taking out Larry Barrett is the best thing we could have done. Without her, they're dangerous. They're crazy, they're vindictive, and they don't give a crap about whether they're going to make it till tomorrow as long as they're having a good time today. But without Barrett giving them direction and purpose, that's all they are. And we can handle that. Cleaners are meaner than the Rikers. They are former sanitation workers who took it upon themselves to rid NYC of the green poison. They use flamethrowers to burn anyone and anything that could be contaminated. Since the death of their leader Joe Farrow and the loss of their napalm supply, the cleaners have been weakened beyond repair. Although they are still dangerous, they aren't a real threat anymore. So those nut jobs in the hazmat suits who call themselves the cleaners, they had themselves a nasty shock the other day when we took out their boss, Joe Farrow. We were hoping they'd just sort of fall apart after that, but no such luck. They just sort of regrouped. Each of them determined to carry on that lunatic Farrow's philosophy. Even worse, once he started running low on ingredients for napalm, they got creative with their chemistry set. So there's less of them and they're less organized, but your average cleaner? He's more dangerous than ever. But the meanest of the bunch are the LMB, a private military contractor that was hired by Wall Street corporations to protect their assets. When the green poison outbreak worsened, the LMB were abandoned inside the quarantine zone and attempted to take NYC by force. 
but since the supposed death of their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Bliss, the LMB have collapsed. While small units remain, they are far from being a threat. You cut the head off a snake, you get a headless snake. Or in the case of the last man battalion, you get a lot of soldier types wandering around without a real direction. They've still got officers and they've still got some kind of discipline, but without bliss, you can tell the light's kind of gone out in their eyes. They're not fighting to take over the island anymore. They're fighting to survive. To put it simply, the factions are still dangerous, but without any leadership, they aren't a real threat and can be dealt with. However, defeating the LMB and taking back the United Nations headquarters was a big turning point. Wouldn't you agree, Roy? The biggest turning point for us probably came when we took back the UN. That's when everything changed. We took down Charlie Bliss and his command structure and cut the last man battalion off at the knees. But at the same time, that's when Keener really went in the wind with Chernenko. It was the moment when we all took a deep breath and asked ourselves the question, what happens next? On a side note, an interesting poster was found in Washington DC. It's an announcement for a conference and it connects the people that we didn't know were connected before. Alice, back in the days being Speaker of the House and apparently also the former Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, is one of them. This ties in with his military-focused attitude, which shows in the description of the Warhound and other archetypes too. Charles Douglas, previously the co-founder of Douglas and Harding and now the instructor at their shooting range, was one of the speakers too. Interestingly enough, we see Bliss return, at least his name, which spoke on the behalf of the Last Man Battalion. Men speaking about how the private sector would benefit the future of warfare. This raises the question, as we know both Alice and Bliss are our enemies, what role does Douglas play in this story? But that's a question for another time. Another poster from an exhibit in a museum reads NYC After Dark, a return to the Big Apple. Other agents have speculated that we might return in a third episode from the Year One DLC, as the blurred background is thought to resemble the NYC skyline. The release month, January, matches the release window of winter as is stated in the Year One plan. With the implementation of other playable areas with upcoming raids outside of DC, a return isn't unlikely. However, an entire playable area in NYC seems a bit ambitious. But who knows, it would be amazing to return to Manhattan in summertime and see what it looks like after 6-7 to seven months. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed the intel brief, I would like to ask you to like or dislike, share, subscribe and click the notification bell to become part of the Masterminds HD community and notification squad. On top of that, you can follow me on Twitter for daily updates and join my Discord if you're looking for an engaged community that revolves around Tom Clancy's Division 1 and 2. Both links are in the description. Visit my Patreon page through the link in the description if you're interested in intel briefs on each faction with the summarized information from this and other videos. Currently, I'm not too active on there, but that will change once I have more time. To end the video, I have a question for you. Do you think we will return to New York City? And if so, what will we do there? Leave your answer in the comment section down below and I'll make sure to get back to you. I'll talk to you in the next video on Discord or on Twitter. Peace out.